This is the first class of my pre-calculus course. Today we're going to do what we usually do in the first classes of my courses. We're going to give an introduction to the course and talk about how to stay organized and the course content. The first question that people may have is, is this a real pre-calculus course? And the answer is yes. This is a complete pre-calculus course. If you do all the homework assignments and uh, study for and pass the test, then you can say you've completed a course that prepares you for calculus. Now, you should probably know that pre-calculus is often referred to as math analysis. Some people think that these are different. Some people think they're the same, but for all intents and purposes, you can consider pre-calculus to be math analysis. Now there's two versions of pre-calculus in the United States. There's pre-calculus with trigonometry and there's pre-calculus without trigonometry. The version that I'm teaching here is pre-calculus without trigonometry. Now pre-calculus with trigonometry means that an entire trig course is going to be taught inside that pre-calculus curriculum. And the reason that I'm teaching uh, pre-calculus without trigonometry is that I have just chosen to teach a separate course that is the prerequisite for this course uh, that is completely trigonometry. So the way that the curriculum is organized just depends on the teacher, the school, the textbook. In my curriculum, I've decided that uh, trigonometry is a big enough subject and a unique subject to the point where I think it's uh, better to just teach it as a separate course. So what this means is that you must take a full trigonometry course before taking this course, a complete trigonometry course. You can take it on my channel. I have a trigonometry course on my channel, or you can take it somewhere else. Now, in my geometry course, we introduce some basic trigonometry. Generally, you learn some basic trig in uh, a geometry course in high school. And you'll also learn some trig in intermediate algebra, also called algebra two in high school. Because high schools don't really teach separate trig courses, they usually mix the trig with uh, other courses. And some students who have taken uh, a geometry class in high school and or an intermediate algebra class, algebra two in high school, will say that trig that I learned or they're going to ask, that trig that I learned, is that enough to prepare for this course? And the answer is no, it's not. Uh, typically, students don't learn enough trig in high school at those levels. So you need to take a complete trigonometry course before taking this course. So here's where you are in the uh, math curriculum. Precalculus is traditionally 12th grade math, but I want you to understand that uh, your age or your grade does not matter. You can take precalculus when you're six years old. All that matters is that you've fulfilled this prerequisite. And I would say that if you're waiting until the 12th grade to take precalculus, then that means you're late to the party. Uh, you really need to take it before the 12th grade. A lot of students take it in the, the 11th or 10th or 9th or even sooner than that. Um, so I would not recommend waiting until the 12th grade. So this document is designed to explain to people why math is so important in the curriculum. The two most important subjects in the academic world are English and math, but English is generally not going to stop students. It's not going to prevent students from going forward if you speak English uh, fluently. But math is probably the most common subject that is uh, a barrier to students' ability to uh, go forward and have options in college. So if you want to succeed in the academic world, if you're a student or a homeschooler or a teacher watching this, you need to understand that the number one thing that you can do to help students is to push them forward in, in the math curriculum. But uh, people in the school system will tell you the exact opposite. They'll tell you that you should uh, hold back. So be aware of that. There is no textbook required 
in this course, I will provide all the class problems, homework, and uh, answers to the homework problems. But if you want to get a supplementary textbook, uh, that's probably a good idea because you can buy an infinite number of textbooks on Amazon and uh, you can have uh, some extra problems, you know, if you want to have a, another resource. Just be sure not to buy uh, new textbooks because they cost anywhere from 100 to sometimes even $300 depending on the book you're buying. Whereas if you buy a used textbook, you can get them for five, ten, fifteen dollars. So I'll give you a recommendation of a textbook you can buy. There are, there's all kinds of different uh, pre-calculus textbooks. You want to make sure that you get a good one, a good textbook, because there's a lot of them out there that are not so good. That's not really the case with pre-calculus. Usually, when you're at this level of mathematics, most of the pre-calculus textbooks are fairly good. So at this point in your math education, you really need a graphing calculator, one that is approved for college entrance exams. And so you can go on these websites to figure out which calculators are approved. A scientific calculator is not good enough, and you're not allowed to use your phone when you're in school. So you uh, really should not be using phones because if you spend all your time trying to learn how to use the calculator on your phone and then you take a test in school and you're not allowed to use your phone, you have to use a graphing calculator, well you won't know how to use your graphing calculator because you spent all your time trying to figure out how to use your phone. So this is typically what happens to students. So um, this is something that you need. It's not an option in this course. You need a graphing calculator. and. The one that I recommend is the uh, Texas Instruments 84 Plus, not because it's the best calculator, but just because it's the most common used, and I'm going to be using that one in this course, so it's going to be a huge benefit to you getting that calculator, because everything that I tell you to do is going to apply directly to your calculator. The problem with this is that if you buy a new one, they cost anywhere from $100 to $150. Some people may not want to do that, so you can uh, you can get a uh, an older version, which is fine. I would recommend getting a Texas Instruments because there's a lot of things that uh, well that the calculators just haven't really changed in terms of their format much in uh, 20 years. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be telling you regarding the TI-84 Plus is going to apply to uh, other t Texas Instruments calculators. But just be aware that Casio and Hewlett Packard, they, they sell very good graphing calculators also. It's just going to be up to you to figure out how to use them. Now, if you buy a TI-84 Plus, do not get the CE version. CE stands for Color Edition. You don't want to get that version because it has a rechargeable battery. And what will happen is you'll tell a student to get their calculator and they'll say well it's not charged so I can't use it so that calculator basically just becomes a useless device and so you want to stay away from that you want to get the the regular version of the TI-84 plus that has disposable batteries those batteries will last full for uh, six months and uh, you can get a replacement uh, pack or a, uh, a backup pack and just have those with you just in, in case uh, your batteries run out. So uh, this course is going to work like all my other courses. The minimum pace is two videos per week and uh, each video has a homework assignment. So there's going to be two videos per week and two homework assignments per week. And uh, that's going to take uh, six months. Okay, but you can actually speed up if you want to and do three to five classes per week or even more classes per week. And that's going to take you only between two and four months. So I want you to understand that you control the speed that you move through this uh, course. But two videos per week is the minimum. If you watch any less than that, then you're not going to learn this material. Is that clear? Now, a lot of people will say that two videos per week doesn't seem like a lot I mean how can you say that that's an actual an actual course two videos per week that doesn't seem like anything well that's actually a lot of work 
every class is designed to take you about two hours. The, the average uh, video length is about an hour and a half, but you're going to be stopping the video and uh, doing problems. So two hours is a long time, and you're going to get a homework assignment after every class. So it doesn't seem like two videos per week is a lot, but that's actually a significant amount of work. Now, if you're a student who doesn't have a lot of patience, or if you're a young student, uh, some people may say, well, there's no way that I'm going to make it through a two-hour class. Well, you can make it through a two-hour class as long as you understand that you're only required to do two videos per week. So if you're a homeschooler and you have a young student and he or she is going to complain and say that, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do a two-hour video, don't accept any excuses from your student. Uh, just get it done and don't complain about it. Uh, it's only two videos per week. Is that understood? That's it. Just make sure that your student understands that it's only two videos per week. Um, now, just be aware that uh, some students may say, well, I, I can go as fast as I want. I can do three or four videos per day. Well, the limiting factor is the homework. Every video has a homework assignment, and you're required to do that assignment. It's not an option. If you don't do the homework that's assigned in any math course, you will learn absolutely nothing in that course. That's the way that math works. So you don't have a choice. You must do the, the homework assignment. The homework actually proves that you know something. Anybody can watch three, four, or five videos per day, but that doesn't prove that you know anything. Completing the homework assignment is going to prove that you actually know something. And I know that a lot of people are going to resist that and say, no, 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 I, I, don't, I don't have to do the homework. If you don't do the homework, it's 100% guarantee you're going to learn absolutely nothing in the entire course. End of story. So you can resist that all you want, but I'm just telling you this is the way it works with math. You do the homework, you learn. You don't do the homework, you learn nothing. That's the way it works. So the homework assignment limits your speed. You may be able to watch three or four or five videos per day, but you're not going to be able to do three or four or five uh, homework assignments per day. That's just too much work. And you need to be careful about getting burnt out. Um, if you do more than two videos per week, then it's going to start to seem as though all you're doing is math. And you have to be very careful not to get burnt out. But I do want to tell you that there are ways that you can speed up. And I'm going to show you one way uh, right now. So let's say that you choose You have your, your seven days of the week, and let's say that you choose Monday and Thursday to watch your videos. Now, I want you to be aware that the way that this course is going to work is that once you finish a certain portion of the course, for example, let's say you finish the first 25% uh, of this course, what's going to happen is I'm going to have a, uh, a class that is going to prepare you for the test and if you're taking if you're watching your videos on Monday and Thursday then Monday in this case would be uh, the class where you prepare to take the test and then you're going to actually take the test on Thursday and in on, on Monday you're going to take two practice exams in this scenario and then you're going to take the actual exam on Thursday but I want you to be aware that just taking the tests that takes up an entire week just preparing for the test and taking the test and there's going to be uh, four tests in this course and there's going to be four classes preparing you for those tests so that is eight classes that are just preparing you to take tests or actually taking the tests. Now when you prepare to take the final exam, you're going to have two classes that prepare you for those exams and then you're going to have two classes where you actually take the exams because it's going to be a two-part final test. And if you include this class, which is the first class, um, 
where we're not doing any math, we're just doing administrative stuff. And then you have an, another class at the end of the course where we're talking about how to give yourself a grade. If you add all these classes up, that's uh, 14 classes which are just uh, taking tests or administrative stuff. That's almost two months of classes. So you need to take these tests. You can't avoid that. But one thing that I want to suggest to you is that rather than waiting until Monday to take your practice tests, you can take your practice tests to prepare for the actual test on Friday and then study on Sunday and then take the actual uh, tests on Monday and in that way you eliminate an entire week in terms of the actual time. And so if you do that, uh, you can actually knock off two months from the amount of time that it takes to finish this course. So that's one way that you can speed up. I, I wouldn't want you to have to, uh, to spend an entire six months taking this course. And for example, today, when you, when you uh, finish this class, you can just jump right into the second class if you want to. You don't have to wait you know, until the next day that you've assigned uh, for, the, uh, for, for your schedule. So that is the pace of the course. And those are just some suggestions um, regarding the, uh, how you can uh, structure your, your week. So I could talk for hours about this particular topic here. I'm not going to do that. But this is just a bit of good news. And uh, the good news is it really doesn't take you know 15 years. If you count kindergarten, it takes 15 years to finish the mass sequence in uh, the K-12 system in the United States. But it doesn't really take that long. It only takes about maybe three to four years to finish the mass sequence. Uh, the dropout rate in the school system, uh, the number of students that don't finish the, the mass sequence is about 99%. So it takes 15 years and a 99% dropout rate. Okay, so obviously the school system isn't really a great system if you want to learn math. If you go to the community college system, it's much more efficient and it only takes five years. Now they don't really have a lot of remedial courses. They used to have remedial courses in the community colleges in where I come from in California. I think they eliminated a lot of that. But uh, the point is you don't have to take 15 years and if you if you teach even more efficiently and you eliminate all the administrative stuff that you have to go through in, in uh, college then you can even go faster than that. And so what you'll find is that in the school system, if we're generous, about 5% of the, the work that you do in the math curriculum in the K-12 system in the United States uh, is actual material that prepares you for college. The other 95% is material that is just a complete waste of time. So most of the time that you spend in school is completely wasted. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that 5% that is actually useful and we're going to triple or quadruple it and uh, so you're going to learn a lot more math but you're actually going to spend a lot less time and do a lot less work than you would in the school system because uh, as you can see that this is actually less than what you would do in the school system so that's the whole principle here and again I can talk about that for hours but I'm not going to bore you by going into that uh, for the next two hours. Uh, th that's not really the purpose of this class. So you're going to be uh, giving yourself uh, scores on the homework and the tests and you're going to assign yourself a grade at the end of the course. And a lot of students are going to say, well, why would we do that? This is not a real course. Well, this is a real course and as I've explained, almost two months of this course is going to be taking tests. And so a huge part of this course is determining whether or not you know the material. That's the purpose of giving yourself scores and taking tests. Anybody can just declare that they know something, but uh, you need to be able to prove that you know something. And that's what the purpose of the tests are. The tests will tell you whether or not you actually know. 
you might say, well, I know this material. I'm, I'm confident that I know this material. But if you take the test and then you fail it, then that's me telling you that you thought you knew, but you actually don't. Math is something that you have to actually use. You have to actually prove that you know it. And uh, if you can't pass the test, then that actually proves that you don't know the material. As I said, I'm going to be providing uh, homework problems and the answers to the homework problems. But a lot of students will say, well, if you give me the answer, can I just write the answer and uh, not actually do the work? Some some people may say that. I have, I've had students that say that I shouldn't be giving the answers to the homework problems in the homework assignments. But uh, yes, you need the answers. You need to make sure that your homework is complete and neat and in chronological order in your binder, as we're going to talk about. But you also need to make sure that your homework is correct. It's not acceptable to complete the homework assignment and have half the problems be wrong. If you're not checking your, your answers to the homework and making sure that you got the right answer, that's like driving on the road and believing that you're going the speed limit, but you don't have a speedometer to make sure that you are going the speed limit. It's like driving on the road, but having no way to know that you're actually driving on the road. Maybe you're, you're going off-road. Uh, the answers help you to make sure that you're doing the math correctly, and if you don't have the answers to verify, then there's no point in doing the homework in the first place. So that's probably obvious to most people, but there are some people out there that have gotten the wrong idea when it comes to the homework. And having the answers is not going to allow you to cheat because you're going to have to show your work. That's going to prove that you actually did, did the work. Now, you should probably print out the following pages and put them at the beginning of your binder. So this is just describing the course. You can write your name here. And we have the uh, contents, your homework, the, the tests, and the performance results. So those are the three things that should be in your binder uh, beside your three-hole punch, of course. And this is just a quick description of the course and who's teaching the course and a very detailed explanation of the curriculum. So that is the first page on your uh, or in your binder. And then these are the second and third pages. So again, you can put your name here. And here's your uh, the, the point distribution and how we assign grades for the course. And this is what's most useful to you. Let's say on the first assignment you get uh, uh, 35 out of 38 then you can write that here and keep track of your scores like so so at the uh, end of the course you can add up all your scores and then we're going to scale the homework score because all the homework is going to be worth 400 points regardless of how many problems there are and then of course you add up all your test scores and you're going to take your scaled homework score and your test, uh, the sum of the test scores, and add them up, and that's going to be your course score, and then you can calculate a grade based on that. Now you can uh, copy this down, but obviously nobody's going to want to do that. Uh, so you can copy all this stuff down if you want onto a Word program. But uh, nobody's going to want to do that, so you can use a link. Uh, but nobody's going to want to write all, all this in, so I'm going to leave something in the, uh, the description section that you can click on. And uh, if you have a better way to provide this, uh, let me know. Microsoft allows you to share documents, so this is the link that Microsoft, uh, the links Microsoft gave me, so you can get a PDF or a Word doc. So you don't have to put this in your binder, but it would just make it uh, look a lot more official, and it really uh, explains what you're doing. So, um, so you can use the left and right arrow keys to jump forward, the L and J keys to jump forward, um, and of course uh, you can take screenshots. It's probably best just to use your phone to take a picture of the homework that you need. 
you can go online and 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 uh, the internet will tell you how to take a screenshot if you want to do it that way. Okay, so that was the introduction part of this uh, this class. Now, if you've taken one of my courses before, you don't necessarily have to listen to the part about staying organized. Just make sure that you have your uh, equipment ready. Uh, make sure that you have a new three ring binder. It has to be a new binder. You can take the uh, the binders from your previous courses and put them in your closet and keep them forever. It's a record of what you did when you took these courses. And uh, But make sure you have that new binder and you don't necessarily have to listen to this part of the, the class if you don't want to. And if you trust that I know what I'm doing when it comes to the course content, you don't have to listen to that either. So there's two ways to stay organized. There's the digital route and there's the uh, physical binder route. Um, the biggest difference between these two is that this route will probably cost you uh, uh, at least a thousand dollars whereas this route will cost you maybe twenty or thirty dollars so that's a big difference there are positives and negatives to each uh, method but uh, let's start with the three ring binder route so usually when I tell people to get uh, the equipment that they need they will buy all the wrong equipment and so you need to make sure that you get the right stuff uh, from day one and this is something that you need to do throughout your entire education not just this course so let's start out with the three ring binder the three ring binder is the center of your entire uh, course it's the center of everything and you want to keep everything together in one place if you can and that binder is going to be it's going to be everything for this course. If you can't stay organized then you might as well just quit and that's true of every course in the academic world. If you can't stay organized there's no point in even uh, taking the uh, course. So you need a binder that is uh, one inch thick. You don't want a binder that's really big because if you drop it it'll get damaged and you don't want a binder that's too small because then you won't be able to fit enough paper in it. And you want a three ring binder that has diagonal rings. The binders that have circular rings will damage the paper and those binders don't hold as much paper as the diagonal rings. Why they're still making binders with circular rings, I don't know. It probably has something to do with a copyright rule or something. Or a, I, mean, I mean a patent. Um, you need lined paper that's college ruled and I suggest getting uh, these uh, paper mate mechanical pencils. Why people are using normal pencils, I don't know. Why you would want to use a, a or carry a pencil sharpener with you, I, I don't understand that. Uh, you want to get these paper made pencils because once the eraser wears down you can replace it with another eraser. So you want to get an extra pack of erasers. If you get these pencils here, then once the eraser runs down, if you try to put an eraser on top of it, a replacement eraser it will make it to where you can't really use the pencil very easily so you don't want to get these you want the paper mate that look like these here um, also you'll need a portable three hole punch and the reason for that is that you may need to print something out and put it in your binder you want everything in your binder um, and reinforcement stickers just in case your papers get damaged. Now, like I said, people tend to get all the wrong things. Don't buy these transparent plastic uh, three hole punches because if students drop them one time, they'll break. It's a waste of money. Don't buy these folders um, because if you drop the folder one time, the papers will go all over the place and it's just, uh, it's, it's not a good way to organize your work. Also, you don't want to thumb through your, your work. It's just so easy for your papers to get out of order that you should never be using these folders. Uh, again, students are going to ignore everything I say and they're just going to buy these anyway. Well, I'm telling you that this is not an option. Just do what I tell you to do when it comes to organization and save yourself a lot of time and energy. When it comes to this course, uh, you need to get the right equipment okay it's not an option when it comes to the spiral a notebook you don't want one of those because if you have to again print something out where are you gonna put it 
uh, now a lot of students will say well I'll just put it in something separate well you don't want uh, your work in different uh, places you want it all in the same place that's the whole point of a three ring binder and a three hole punch is that you can put all your work in the same place um, so these are the things that you need to get um, if you're going to be serious about about any course so now we'll talk about the digital uh, the digital route um, so billions of dollars are spent on the schools in the United States but most of that money to be honest with you is a waste of money it doesn't really improve the quality of kids education I remember one time I was taking a physics course and the uh, the professor in the college he had brand new uh, computers and he looked at them and he said uh, the uh, the administration gave me these computers and I can't do anything with them they're useless that's generally how it works in the school system is that they give you you know millions of dollars of equipment and then you can't even use it for anything well when it comes to these devices that's not the case with these devices, these are actually going to help improve students' education. I can tell you, I'm not a salesman. I'm not selling these devices. But I've had an iPad and a two-in-one laptop that's compatible with uh, Windows Inc. or that has that's designed with Windows Inc. And I can tell you that this really improves productivity and helps students to uh, stay organized. I was working with a student that was attending a private school and they actually required that every student had an iPad so these things are going to rapidly become part of the the school system it's just I think it's inevitable because sometimes uh, uh, with math textbooks for example you can easily have a five pound textbook why would you carry around you know five ten fifteen pounds of textbooks when you can just put all your textbooks on an iPad um, and then everything that you have it will just be on on a digital device so this is really where things are going now you don't need to go the digital route you don't need to spend you know one or two thousand dollars to buy this stuff so I'm not telling you you have to do this I'm just saying that uh, the, the probably the biggest benefit of this is students just enjoy using this equipment one time I was working with a, a little girl a sixth grader and I would let her use my iPad. Uh, oftentimes when I work with students, I let them use the iPad. And one day I showed up without the iPad because it was raining and I didn't want it to get wet. And she was really disappointed. And I realized that this girl uh, was looking forward to working with me just because she wanted to use the iPad. Now that's a powerful thing to, uh, to think about that students are actually drawn to their academic work because they enjoy using these devices so that tells you something so you can get either a two-in-one laptop or an iPad or both um, just be aware that if you buy both of these uh, there are syncing problems between the devices so you're gonna have to deal with those problems um, so if you buy the iPad you'll need the Apple pen if you buy a two-in-one laptop you'll need uh, any kind of digital pen they sell a lot of different ones that were that are compatible with uh, the two-in-one laptops but probably the most common one is the bamboo pen that's the one I'm using now and both of these uh, devices they use uh, their they can be used with OneNote OneNote is part of uh, Microsoft Office's program most people have heard of uh, Word Excel in PowerPoint but they have not necessarily heard of OneNote. OneNote is what I'm using now. So you can see that I have a uh, pre-calculus, that's a, a notebook, and I have sections, and I can go to certain parts of, uh, uh, let's say I go to the, my math courses, I have of the sections at the left, I have the yellow, the blue, and the green section, and I have different pages, so this is just uh, how OneNote works. OneNote has a lot of bugs as most Microsoft programs do for example it'll throw you across the screen for no reason uh, multiple times as you're using the program and Microsoft has not fixed this in uh, in five six years 
but it is a powerful note-taking program. Now, in, in case you don't know, a two-in-one laptop is a uh, uh, it's a laptop that flips around and it becomes a tablet. And just be sure that if you buy one, that it has a Windows Ink capability. That just means that it's compatible with a digital pen. The entire computer is designed to be compatible compatible with a digital pen. So uh, these are the options. Um, if you want, if you want an actual computer. You can kill two birds with one stone. You can you can get this for your school, but you can also get this so that you have an actual computer. That's the two-in-one laptop. If you want something that uh, is more practical on the go, something that you can take with you that's not hard to uh, to take with you in your backpack and and really have a long battery life, the iPad is more practical. But of course, the iPad is not an actual full computer, so that's that's the difference and you can sync actually between your phone and uh, your two-in-one laptop and uh, you know if you have an iPad so you can sync between all these different devices just be aware that the cloud doesn't always work right and that causes a lot of problems so the cloud is very powerful if it works but unfortunately sometimes it doesn't work so uh, that is the organization part of this course again if you can't stay organized just quit there's no point in even taking any course if you don't stay organized um, so which which route do I recommend they both have positives and negatives uh, but uh, you need to choose one of those routes so now we're going to talk about the course content and this part of the class is going to be most mostly useful for people who actually know the math curriculum if you don't know the math curriculum this may not be something that is really uh, a good use of your time to look at this but uh, I'm just going to give an overview as you can see it's a very detailed list most college catalogs only give a couple sentences describing the uh, curriculum but since this is on on uh, you know it's video on the internet it's probably best to give you a detailed list so that you know for sure what you're going to be doing when you look at the state standards uh, that list is going to be very undetailed also um, these are the topics that I'm not going to cover linear programming I've never seen that used in calculus it's possible that uh, it could be used but I don't want to teach you something that is not really it's something you're not going to ever see again uh, at least not in, in the, the primary calculus courses same with this theorem here now vectors are going to be necessary for the first college level physics course and also the third semester or the third course in calculus but when you when you take those courses they're going to assume that you know nothing about vectors so you're, you're not required to know something about vectors before taking those courses they're going to teach it from scratch so for that reason you don't really need to learn vectors prior to those courses but another reason and really the most important reason that I'm not going to cover vectors is that most students never make it to the third sem semester or the third course in calculus and one of the primary reasons that they don't make it is they fail the first calculus course calculus one and the reason they fail is because they don't have enough algebra when students have problems in the first uh, course in calculus it's not the calculus that's the problem it's the algebra and so if you really want to design a good pre-calculus curriculum it needs to focus on algebra that's the whole purpose of pre-calculus is to prepare you for calculus and if students have uh, more problems with algebra than anything else obviously we need to focus on algebra but if we uh, cover vectors vectors is a very big topic and it will tend to take away the focus from the algebra so it doesn't make any difference if you become an expert with vectors because if you fail the first uh, course in calculus because you don't know enough algebra it doesn't really make any difference because you're never going to get to the third calculus course and the same is true with matrices except matrices are often covered in the fourth or fifth uh, uh, course in the math uh, in, the, in the college 
sequence, um, depending on how the, the curriculum is arranged. So for those reasons, we're not going to cover these, these two topics. And systems of nonlinear equations are a little more important, but again, it's just not important enough to spend a lot of time on that. Now, limits are actually part of the calculus curriculum, so you're going to learn that for the first time when you take uh, calculus. They're going to assume that you know nothing about limits. So you're going to learn from scratch. And the reason that we're not going to cover this is the same reason that most pre-calculus teachers don't get to this. There's just not enough time. Uh, the pre-calculus curriculum is the biggest math curriculum of all the courses in the sequence, and so most teachers just don't get to this. And again, if you if you fail the first calculus course, the reason is going to be algebra. It's not going to be because you don't know enough about limits. So um, these are the reasons that I'm not going to cover these particular topics in this course. Um, now, it's kind of interesting. When I chose these topics to omit, um, I wasn't really looking at the state standards. But if you look at the, uh, the states that rank the highest in the US, the highest ranking state is uh, Massachusetts. So let's look at the Massachusetts state standards. And as far as I know, usually the states are pretty much, uh, they, the standards are pretty much the same. So let's click on mathematics. And at the very upper left, we have a table of contents button. And we're going to scroll down. And part of the reason that I'm showing you this is to get you to uh, be more active when it comes to your education. So I'm going to click on modal precalculus. And we have just brief overviews and then we'll go to the detailed part of the the standards here so if you look at this list so it starts here and again pre-calculus is one of the biggest it is probably the biggest curriculum of all of all the uh, courses in the the mass sequence and if you look here this is the list that is provided by Massachusetts the number one ranking state and that's it that's the list so it's really not a very detailed list and what's interesting about this is that they seem to want to focus on the very things that I'm not covering in the course vectors and and matrices so not only is this list not very detailed but they're focusing on things that, as I just explained, are not really going to, well, they're not the things that you really need to focus on in order to succeed in calculus. So this is what you typically typically get with the, uh, the government. They're giving you bad advice when it comes to your education. And algebra, again, is the most important thing, but you can see here that this is, I mean, anybody who knows anything about algebra knows that this list here is just ridiculous. This is a completely useless list. And uh, trigonometry is one of the most important things when you go into calculus. But this list, again, is so brief, it's just completely useless. And they have just random things like understanding and applying theorems about circles. Well, you learn theorems about circles in geometry, but you almost never use that stuff again. But for some reason, they chose to tell you that theorems about circles are, are really important for the for the pre-calculus curriculum. So it seems like they just are throwing a bunch of random stuff on this list without actually uh, you know doing any work to figure out what students really need to learn. But we'll go over this quickly here. So we learned polynomials in my beginning algebra course, just the basic stuff, but we're going to learn uh, a lot more about polynomials and we learned uh, parabolas in my intermediate algebra course and circles in my geometry course but uh, we're also going to learn uh, ellipses and hyperbolas that are going to be introduced in this course 
and all four of those things are called the conics. So we'll discuss that. And sequences and series are going to be useful, especially for the second course in calculus, but also for the first. Counting and probability is just something you're going to see throughout the, the math curriculum. And you will see combinatorics in, uh, in uh, calculus when you go over the, uh, the binomial theorem. And there are various, again, there's various applications of it, so it's just something you need to learn. Uh, polar coordinates and parametric equations and also uh, polar equations uh, you're going to learn for the first time in this curriculum and uh, this is again just taking what we already learned and expanding upon it average is very important for all levels of mathematics and and the real world uh, but it's also important for calculus we're going to review radian units and degree units for angle measures. And so, again, if you have a, a question about the curriculum, let me know. Uh, so your homework for today is to get your calculator. And if you're going to buy a supplementary textbook, do that. And get your uh, uh, print out your your sheet here. You don't have to use this, but as you can see, it's going to be very useful to keep track of your scores. And I may provide a, a, another page that's just like a explanation of what the course is that you can put at the front of your binder. And the fourth thing for your homework is to get your binder. Choose which route you're going to use and get that equipment. So please understand that this is a homework assignment. You need to get that done before starting the next class. So that said, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next class when we start the content of the course.